Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to join us uh, this evening for tonight's webinar. My name is Jenny Gibbons and I'm a dairy scientist at AHDB Dairy and I'm delighted to bring in you tonight's webinar um, on innovation and hoof health with um, our presenter, uh, Professor um, John Huxley. Um, tonight's webinar is uh, being run through the Euro Dairy Network, which is a network of 14 countries from Ireland to Poland and Sweden to Italy. It aims to put farmers at the centre of uh, practice-based innovation through sharing knowledge and solutions. And you can find out more about Euro Dairy tonight on www.eurodairy.eu. Um, so tonight's webinar has actually proved very popular. We have over 200 registrations from dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants and researchers right across uh, Europe and even further afield to Australia, Brazil, the US and Canada. Um, tonight we're actually trying something different. Uh, John and I are delivering the webinar in front of a live audience um, from the Euro Dairy Network here in Stratford-upon-Avon in England. And um, so we have uh, some interactive audience participation perhaps later. So the plan of action for tonight is that John will, will run through his presentation which will take about 25 or 30 minutes and there will be uh, time for comments and questions um, at the end. Everyone at home will stay muted throughout the entire webinar, but if you would like to ask a question, there is a control panel on the right-hand side, and you can type in your, your question into the chat box, and uh, I will pose your question to John when he's finished his webinar. Um, we expect the whole process to take uh, roughly about an hour. I'd like to sincerely thank our digital manager, Alana, who's working uh, uh, behind the scenes to make sure to keep this running as smooth as possible. But if we do encounter any technical difficulties, please do uh, bear with us. Um, so without further delay, I'm delighted to introduce John. Uh, John was born and raised on a dairy farm in North Wales, and he graduated from the Royal Veterinary College, London, in 1995. After some time on commercial practice, he joined Bristol Vet School, later moving on to the Nottingham uh, Vet School, where he's currently Professor of Cattle Health and Production. Um, he is a UK and European specialist in cattle health and production medicine, and his interests are predominantly in endemic disease of dairy cattle, uh, particularly uh, lameness and uh, mastitis. Um, so, John, um, I'm going to hand over the controls uh, to you here. Great, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, good, uh, good evening to everybody listening in the office and at home, and uh, good evening to everybody in the room as well. Uh, slightly uh, interesting situation with two audiences uh, this evening, but we'll we'll see how we get on. Uh, so, what I would like to do for the for the next half an hour is is really just give you a high level overview of of where lameness research has gone over the last five to eight years. Uh, it's been a really exciting time in the lameness field um, over that period of time. Uh, things have moved on a long way. And, and we've started to challenge a lot of the received wisdom that has been out there for a long time uh, on uh, on what is causing some of the uh, some of the underlying diseases that which which we all know are are so common on farm. And so I'd like to sort of give a, a sort of very high level overview of pulling all of that together over sort of 25 minutes ish. Uh, I'm deliberately not going to go into the detail of the science uh, this evening, um, A, because we just don't have enough time, but, but secondly, because I think what would, be, what would be nice to do is to really just put it all together uh, uh, from start to finish and, and uh, be interested in your comments and your questions afterwards to see what, what you think. Clearly, if uh, anybody would like details of the science, the underpinning work is, is 20, 30 papers now, uh, and you're welcome to contact me for those papers uh, and or we can perhaps cover perhaps a little bit of more more detail as we uh, as we get to the questions at the end of the webinar. So first of all, can I thank Euroday for the opportunity to speak to you all um, this evening, whether you're at uh, home or in the office or here in the room. It's a real pleasure, and I'd like to thank HDB Dairy for uh, for organising the event, uh, which is titled Innovations in, in Hoof Health. But what I'd really like to do is focus on these lesions, the lesions of claw horn disruption. 
um, all our work uh, at Nottingham has been has been based on the, the lesions of claw horn disruption. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about digital dermatitis uh, tonight, uh, not because it's not an important disease. Clearly, it's a very important disease in most developed dairy nations, but our work has focused on the other half of lameness, the claw horn lesions. And by claw horn lesions, I principally mean three conditions, sole ulcer, sole hemorrhage, and white line disease. However, I'm going to, right from the outset, I'm going to group the first two because as far as I'm concerned, sole ulcer and sole hemorrhage are in fact just uh, severe and milder manifestations of the same underlying condition. I think everything that we can say, say about this severe manifestation of a sole ulcer, underlying principles wise, most of it would be the same for sole hemorrhage as well. So actually, I don't really differentiate the two anymore. I just see them as, as, as different uh, severities of disease. And in fact, I'm going to go even further than that. And I'm going to say to me, this isn't a sole ulcer. This is a cull cow. And I'd like to perhaps uh, at the end of the next 20 minutes, try and demonstrate to you why I say that now as we go through. Similarly with white line disease, again I've put a range of manifestations of disease starting with the more severe end at this end where we see complete separation of the white line. If, you, uh, if in really advanced cases we'll obviously uh, very often see subsole abscesses as well so uh, when, we go, when we trim these out with a knife you may very well hit that pocket of pus um, which is the most sort of severe end of, of disease spectrum but actually again and we've been doing this a lot with a lot of the work we've been doing, if you pick these cows up in the early stages of disease, disease, when they first go mildly lame, what you see is hemorrhage in the white line, so these type lesions rather than the full separation. So those are the diseases I would like to focus on this evening and in order to set up the rest of the presentation I've got sort of three slides really covering the, the background and, and really it's the next slide which, which is particularly key but, but actually if you can understand the next three slides a lot of what I'm then going to go on to talk about falls off um, an understanding of the basic underlying principles uh, that we'll talk through. So if we just review a little bit of hoof anatomy the, the hoof capsule itself is, is composed of two principal structures and they are the wall here and then the sole. Now the wall is formed at the coronary band so the wall actually grows from up here at the coronary band and it's growing downhill towards the toe at about six millimeters per month. So it takes 12 plus months for, for, for wall which is being produced today to actually become weight bearing um, uh, about 12 to 14 months later. And then we've got the sole. And the sole is growing out from the base of the foot at about the same rate of growth, that five, six millimeters per month. And those two structures are joined together at the white line. Uh, so the white line is actually a biological junction between the wall growing from the coronary band up here and the sole which is growing out from the base of the foot. Now what I'd like to do is, is show you a cross section now where we've, where we've bandsawed up through a post-mortem specimen and what, we will, what we've done is we've taken a claw and we've bandsawed on that plane and so that is what you would see if you opened up that split claw. So we split this claw in half on that line and you open it up, you open it up and that's the sort of the cross-sectional specimen we, we just want to spend a couple of minutes on because this probably is, is the most key slide for everything that I would like to talk about this evening. So again, we've got the wall here, so the wall, uh, this, this structure of the highest, the highest tensile strength, its job is the, is the key weight-bearing structure within the foot and it's growing from the coronary band uh, up at the top here going downhill five to six millimeters per month. Then we've got the sole on the base of the foot and the sole is being produced from a very thin layer of germinal cells in this region called the dermis here. So there is a very thin layer and we're talking about a matter of one, one plus millimeters thick these cells are absolutely key because these are the cells which are going to produce the sole. And you'll perhaps see in a second why uh, they, they are so key to us because that is a truly terrible place to be sat and I'll demonstrate to you on the next slide why I say that. Um, and then within the hoof capsule itself we've got this wedge-shaped bone, the, the distal phalanx, 
this is, we're going to see a lot of this wedge-shaped bone as we go through, and it's a wedge-shaped bone that hit, sits neatly within the hoof capsule. I want to introduce two other structures uh, uh, now at this point. Firstly, this very strong attachment of connective tissue, which anchors the distal phalanx to the wall. That is a key structure because that is what tightly holds the distal phalanx into the hoof capsule. Uh, and we'll come back to that as we go through. And secondly, the digital cushion, this pad of fat which lies in this very narrow band underneath the distal phalanx and before the sole. And to give you an idea, we're talking about a region here in totality of about five to seven mils. So it's a really narrow structure. And it is a terrible, terrible place to be. Because if you just look at the basic biomechanics of how the leg functions, all of the weight of the animal bears down through the limb. And here's uh, the exact two-size skeletal model uh, to equate to the picture. So all of the weight of the animal is actually bearing down through this wedge-shaped bone, the distal phalanx. And so this very thin layer of cells here is in a, a terrible, terrible place. Above you, you've got six, seven, eight hundred kilograms of cow, and below you, for large parts of the year, in many of our systems, you've got concrete. And we've got this fine five to seven mil layer with this very narrow layer of germinal cells, the ones which are responsible for producing the soul. So fundamentally, claw horn disease is a pressure lesion. That's all, in its most basic form, that's what it is. All we have to do is understand what the animal normally does to mitigate excess pressure in this region and or what can go wrong in some of our systems that means this, this, uh, this system starts to fail. Because as we've already indicated, so now we, the, that we can we can appreciate that all of the weight of the animal is bearing straight th down through this distal phalanx. So firstly, it highlights the importance of that very strong attachment that anchors the distal phalanx to the hoof capsule. So the wall is actually the area of highest tensile strength. It's the, the structure responsible for bearing the weight of the animal. And now what we've got to try and do is understand why we might see problems in this very fine layer of germinal epithelia. Because if those germinal epithelial cells, the ones responsible for producing the soul, get squashed, the first thing they do is bleed, that tissue bleeds. And so that's what we'll see manifesting as soul hemorrhage a number of weeks later as the soul grows out. So this area bleeds, the, the blood that's produced is incorporated into the soul horn as it grows, and we see it a number of weeks later as the horn of the soul grows out. And in its most severe manifestation, we can actually completely crush these very sensitive cells here that are responsible for producing the soul. And if we crush them completely, they stop doing their job, they stop producing the soul, and hence we will see this deficit in the soul growing out, which we call a soul ulcer. And very often we see this small piece of proud tissue protruding through that soul, but that's just a, a manifestation of the biomechanics and, and what happens when we have that, that hole in the integrity of the soul. So fundamentally all we have to do is understand what the claw normally does to mitigate all of that force which is being transferred through it during, walk, during standing and particularly during uh, walking, because of course all the, um, the momentum of the animal is, is generated uh, by the hind legs as the propulsive limbs. Now, this is where very often I start upsetting people when I, when I give this sort of presentation, because up until five, ten years ago, certainly, we would have spent a long time now talking about um, overfeeding concentrate, ruminacidosis, laminitis leading to claw horn disease. Ruminacidosis was, was, was underpinning underpinned all of our understanding of what was causing these diseases. I've had a go at making that stack up from the research literature. I can't do it. I've had one of my PhD students a few years ago have another go at it, trying to see if he could make that story stack up from the research literature. He couldn't do it. And I've now got uh, another one of our PhD students doing a full literature review on this with a full critical appraisal. 
and she is reporting, will be publishing later in the year, that she cannot make this story stack up. If you go back to the research literature, we actually, with this and the underpinning um, ideas here, we can absolutely show that uh, rumen acidosis or high levels of concentrate feeding and claw horn lesions are linked. But as any good statistician or epidemiologist will tell you, correlation does not imply causation. So it is entirely possible for two things to be linked but they're not being causally linked. So one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. And genuinely, I think that's where we are um, with, the, with the literature in this area. Absolutely, you can make it stack up. There's a correlation between those two things. I'm just now not at all convinced that it's causally linked. I'm going to be honest and say there's people who, who in various parts of the world who disagree with me and I would welcome that disagreement uh, and perhaps I need to, uh, to sort of spend the next 20 minutes just, just giving you our idea of where we think we are. But just, uh, just for, for entertainment value um, only uh, and to demonstrate why you, you can't be sure that two things which are highly correlated are causally linked, here we've got the per capita cheese consumption of citizens of the United States correlated with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Those two things are very highly correlated. They are, no matter what statistical test you threw at it, that would be very highly significant correlation, but I think we can all accept it's unlikely those two things are causally linked, just as an illustration. So of course, that now comes down to me to really to, to, to really demonstrate and, and talk you through alternatives to that to that idea. And what I would like to do is just talk you through what I see as the three principal areas which are causing excess pressure on that, that very thin layer of dermis responsible for producing the soul. If we can understand what the causes of that excess pressure are, I think we've got a long way to work towards understanding disease. And I think it's based on three pillars, or at least I'm currently grouping them into three pillars. They are environmental factors, the carving effect, and changes to the normal structure and function of aspects of hoof anatomy. And I'd like to run through them one by one. So first, the environmental factors. It's not my intention to spend too long um, in this area, not because it's not important. I always get accused of, of underplaying the importance of environmental management to, a, as an aspect of lameness control. Clearly, it's absolutely key and fundamental and is the cornerstone of, of most of the lameness control plans that, that exist in, in, in our dairy systems around the world. Um, but it's not where we've been doing most of our work and so by rushing over it, I'm not trying to underestimate its importance. That certainly isn't my my uh, intention. So uh, you'll know what all these are. So the first one I think we have to identify is concrete. I don't care what you say, nobody puts concrete in for cow's benefit. I think we need to, we need to fundamentally grasp that we put ca concrete in for our benefit. Concrete is not in for, for, for the cow's benefit. It is a truly terrible uh, substrate from an animal perspective, great to manage them on, but actually it's just rock hard. I, I, for me, the most entertaining example of, of this is when you go into milking parlours uh, and uh, with concrete floors uh, and uh, the, the dairymen have put rubber matting in the milking parlour because they know standing on it for two to three hours is going to get uncomfortable and so they've gone, done something to try and uh, to mitigate that, that that, that pressure. It's just terrible stuff from an animal point of view, accepting that clearly we need it uh, from a management point of view. But that's going to put a lot of excess pressure which the foot normally wouldn't be exposed to. And then of course we've got this whole area around standing and lying times. This would be the cornerstone of most lameness control plans, looking at time budgets uh, and lying times and, and standing times, particularly in the bottom 25-50% of the herd, the cows which are getting out-competed by the rest of the herd. So we could spend literally days talking about cubicle design, management, substrate and all those other things that go along with it and this aspirational idea of getting cows off their feet for all of the time that they're not eating, drinking, being milked or socialising. Uh, and you know this sort of idealised situation which you can find uh, in well-designed systems. And then of course we've got the other big areas of environmental management, the, the trackways, uh, particularly in the more pasture-based systems uh, and some of the walkways in, in concrete yards. Uh, and I 
are they all UK? Yeah, they're probably all UK, but I could take you pictures like this from, from many parts of the world in the more extensive pasture-based systems at some times of year. Um, but we have to accept from a cow point of view that makes things very difficult because uh, cows watch, they, they watch where they put their front feet their hind feet track up to where their front feet have just left. If you're walking through mud, you have no idea what you're standing on. And so, of course, we aim for these sorts of trackways, which, which deliver uh, a much better walking surface. And then we could go on to talk about all the other things we could do to try and mitigate pressure from the environment on, on the on the claw capsule like uh, rubber matting at the two areas of high standing time, the collecting yard uh, and the feed face, which can uh, for many cows in some in some high yielding systems account for six, seven, eight hours of standing per day in uh, for the lower ranking cows. I also want to include at this point uh, hoof over the growth. It's not quite an environmental factor, but it sort of fits probably best in that category because clearly if we've got hoof, o hoof overgrowth and uh, ledges of, of overgrown hoof applying inappropriate pressures to area of the foot, that is also going to cause us problems. But I think it's important to highlight, particularly with such a diverse audience that we've got both in the room uh, and listening at home, that the relative importance and overall risk uh, of different environmental factors will vary depending on the management system. It's not appropriate just to take management practices from a system and transfer them across because what is important in some of the more extensive pasture-based systems is going to be completely different to the total confinement high yielding systems and it's important we appreciate that the environmental risk factors will vary. So, as I say, not in any way wishing to gloss over its importance, but, but just to move on to, to other things. So the next thing I want to highlight is the carving effect. Um, this is, we've, we've known about this effect for quite a while now, actually, uh, and it, it hasn't really been particularly high on the lameness agenda. I've come right, right back round to it um, over the last 18 months uh, because of some of, the, some of the things that we've been finding in our work, and I think we are probably currently underestimating just how important it is. So the first thing I wanted to highlight at this point is, is just to remind you, A, what a phenomenal process um, parturition of a, sing, of a large singleton um, calf, baby, however you want to frame it, in, in mammals is. You know, in mammals which are giving birth to one large offspring, it is a truly remarkable biological process. It is also a truly remarkably destructive process. Uh, I've watched my wife go through this twice over the last three years, and it, it genuinely, it's, it's when you start breaking it down to its biology, it, it, it's a truly destructive process because, to cut to the chase, this would not normally fit out of this. You know, there's a lot of biological change got to go on to, in order for that to happen. And fundamentally, what has to happen is we've got to see a lot of degradation of connective tissues within the reproductive tract. The reproductive tract, tract has to basically degrade all its connective tissue attachments to allow passage of that large singleton offspring um, out through uh, the birth canal and, and that's why it's destructive but the problem we have is we also know that that what's leading to the degradation of the connective tissues in the reproductive tract have whole body effects this is why some women end up hospitalized because of pelvic pain and pelvic uh, instability um, close to close to giving birth because that whole process degrades the connective tissue attachments to the point that the pelvis becomes unstable. And so what we now know happens is these very strong connective tissue attachments which anchor the distal phalanx to the hoof capsule also get degraded around parturition. And that's clearly got very important consequences for this very narrow layer of cells under the distal phalanx because we can actually see that collagen attachment, that connective tissue attachment running from the bone through into the hoof capsule. And a very nice piece of work done by the Bristol group 10, 15 years ago now demonstrated that around the time of carving, the force required to tear the hoof capsule off uh, the underlying structures was reduced, i.e. there is more movement in the distal phalanx around the time of carving.
So fundamentally, if we want, want to understand why we see most claw horn disease four, six, eight, ten weeks after calving, it's because the damage is being done, or some of the damage is likely to be done because of the increased movement of this pedal bone around calving, and it takes that time for the claw, the sole horn, to grow out before we see the lesions uh, at the sole. So the calving effect, as I say, I think we've, we've probably underestimated its importance. I'm going to come back to it just at the end. And finally, changes to the normal um, structures within the hoof themselves. So I just want to spend the rest of the, the webinar just reviewing some of the recent work that we've been conducting in this area. Um, it's not just us. It's going to build on some work originally conducted by the Zurich group, uh, picked up by Cornell a few years ago. And then we've been one of the groups publishing a, a lot in this area over the last few years. Um, so firstly, again I want to remind you, um, particularly now, of two structures. Firstly, the digital cushion, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and secondly, the distal phalanx, this wedge-shaped bone. Those are two structures that we're going to be referring to. And just fix in your minds, if you can, what they look like in the normal claw. So this is a pretty normal claw that we've got in cross-section here. And just fix in your minds what those two structures look like. So the first thing I would like to talk about is the digital cushion. So originally described um, by uh, the Zurich group, um, actually 15 years ago now, um, and it sat in the literature for, for nearly a decade before anybody else uh, picked up on it. But they did some really lovely um, anatomy of describing these three pads of, of, of fat, soft fat, which lie underneath the bone in the hoof. Uh, in that narrow zone between the bone and the claw capsule. And they described it as, 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 as looking a little bit like a training shoe uh, set up. That sort of, it, it's a nice analogy, but it falls down in one respect, in that the job of the digital cushion, because it's, it, it, it's fat, it's not really compressible. So its job isn't necessarily um, to, as a shock absorber, its, its role is more in force dissipation. So as, it, as the load comes on the digital cushion, it dissipates the, the force onto the wall, the area of high tensile strength. The elastic tissues in the heel uh, and the, the horn of the heel probably do a little bit of, of shock absorbing, but this is about force dissipation. And we've been putting these, putting feet through both MRI and CT scanners, and you can end up with these, these lovely images of these three parallel um, pads of fat which lie um, underneath the bone in the foot and in that 3D reconstruction we saw at the start of the webinar. So three cylinders of fat, um, semi-liquidy type fat, uh, fully forming second lactation. So not fully formed in heifers, fully forming in second lactation. Um, this area got very interesting a few years ago when the Cornell group published the first work that demonstrated that the amount of fat or the, the thickness of the digital cushion was, was uh, correlated to the fatness of the animal. So fat cows had thicker cushions, thin cows had thinner cushions. And that really set the cat amongst the pigeons in the, in, in the sort of lameness world because it really started ad, uh, answering some or asking some very interesting questions. Uh, and the Cornell Group actually framed the first paper they published on this in this context. It wasn't quite the same wording, but it was, it was the same meaning. Do lame cows become thin or do thin cows become lame? Because we all know that thinness and lameness go together. So we all know that lame cows are highly likely to be thin. But this work asked an interesting question, which was, but actually, perhaps thinness leads to lameness. Because if thinness leads to thinning of the digital cushion, that would interfere with the digital cushion's ability to dissipate force, and that could in itself put inappropriate force on the germinal epithelia, causing lameness. And so we ended up with this sort of vicious cycle for a number of years where we knew that lameness had impacts on dry matter intake and nutrition, leading to loss of body condition score. So lameness and thinness went together. But we also know, particularly in the high yielding systems, that particularly the Holstein breed is losing a lot of condition to peak yield. So we have the, the possibility that loss of body condition to peak yield is leading to thinning of the digital cushion, interfering with its uh, ability to function, leading to lameness, then once lame cows stop eating and they become even more thin. And so we were left with this, with this very interesting cycle and, and not really understanding 
where we were. And we've published quite a range of studies looking at this question over the last few years. And we've demonstrated in, uh, in three separate studies using different cows that thinness precedes lameness, either identified by, by mobility score or by treatment for lameness. So we were really starting to tease out that actually loss of body condition may well be leading to lameness, accepting that that then makes the cows even thinner. We've then gone on, this just last year we finished um, uh, probably our most detailed study in this area, funded by AHDB Dairy, I want to highlight because they've really backed us on, on the lameness research over the last uh, uh, five, five years and we've got another five years of funding moving forward. This is our most detailed study and, and what we did here was we followed 185 cows in two herds longitudinally over time through lactation. So we examined them um, about six weeks before calving just after calving at about peak yield and twice through the remainder of lactation. And we picked the feet up and we used ultrasound to measure uh, this area here. So you can actually see this is the sole horn. So you can put a, an ultrasound scanner on the base of the foot and actually image through the foot. So here's the thickness of the sole horn. Here's the bone at the top here. And this area here is the digital cushion and the corium, this thin layer of cells responsible for producing this, the, the soul. I don't want to go into the detail of this, this, this study in a, in, in a great amount of detail now just because of time, but it really has, it really has informed where we are with this. Um, firstly, we can absolutely demonstrate that over time that the thickness of the uh, of the digital cushion or, or the sole soft tissue thickness is, as it's more accurately called, is linked to fatness of the animal. So we can track body condition score loss leading to thinning in this area. But it is incredibly small amounts. So 10 mils of back fat loss, that's equivalent to about one body condition score point, leads to thinning in this area of 0.1 of a mil. So we are talking about really fine margins. We've, it's one of the reasons we've sort of gone off this as a real key underlying cause, accepting it's probably still right. But two other things we found which were really interesting. Firstly, this area here is thinnest around the time of carving. So carving is the time when this area here, measured by ultrasound, is thinnest. And we went, well, actually, that's not surprising, knowing what we know about the carving effect. The, dis the distal phalanx is likely to be sinking around calving, squashing this area, so we measure it thin. But the other thing we discovered was that when the animal had a lesion, this area was actually thicker. So if a lesion was present, the digital cushion and the corium were thicker. I'm going to come back to that in a minute or two. So that's the digital cushion story. We'll wrap it up in a second. The other thing we started doing was looking at the, the the distal phalanx and changes to the bone. Something that a number of, uh, uh, of people around the world and groups have been looking at. A nice paper out of Japan a few years ago demonstrated that we saw changes to the bone in older cows. And if we put some of these, these feet through CT scanners, this is the sort of thing we find. So here's a normal bone. It's got basically a smooth surface. In some animals, after they've been culled, we find this mass of new bone growing off the base of, of the distal phalanx. This is a really extreme example. I've clearly picked one of the worst ones we've got. But you can see uh, different severities. So completely normal, new bone starting to grow. The work we published last year demonstrated that the degree of new bone growth is linked to the amount, uh, to the lameness history of the cow. So animals which have had more lameness during life have more new bone on the distal phalanx. Cows which have had little lameness history have no new bone or less new bone on the distal phalanx. And again, that starts to, to raise some very interesting questions because now I challenge you to fit this bone back into this picture and not put inappropriate force on this very thin layer of cells which are responsible for producing the, the sole horn. It's basically impossible. And the other thing, again, going all the way back to the Zurich Group's 
for work what they what they demonstrated even 15 years ago just using um, anatomy studies was that in cows with sole ulcers they saw scarring of the digital cushion which again if you consider all of that new bone it's probably not very surprising that in these animals which we see with claw horn lesions have uh, damage to the digital cushion and so we're really starting to, to put together now what is going on in the hoof and I'm summarizing I sum this up by saying this is a horrible self-perpetuating downward spiral of disease once an animal develops a claw horn lesion they you start to see new bone growing on p3 that new bone probably leads to damage to the digital cushion which in itself then impairs the ability of the foot to uh, dissipate force which in turn leads to another lesion and so on and so forth this is a vicious downward spiral of disease I now think of the the claw horn lesion cow a little bit like the chronic high cell count cow once you and once you start down this path it is a very difficult train to get off the high cell count escalator the claw horn disease escalator you get on at the bottom and it's very very difficult not to just get shot off the top at some point in the future because of this perpetuating downward spiral of disease and that would fit with a lot of what we see from the field it would explain explain why disease is predominantly seen in older cows and animals which have had previous lameness events again all our latest work is saying that the principal the main risk factor for a claw horn lesion is a previous case of a claw horn lesion it completely overwhelms all of the risk factors secondly once disease becomes chronic cows are more difficult to treat and less likely to recover because once they've got that new bone and damage to the digital cushion it doesn't matter what you do to treat them all that damage is done and thirdly why it often takes time for the benefits of herd intervention programs to become apparent because if you intervene at a herd level with a really nice lameness control program today all of the cows which are already on that escalator aren't going to benefit in any way shape or form because you can't get them off that escalator the only cows which will benefit are the heifers which carve into the herd after the change in management so it's going to take one two three years before you see the benefits kicking through and that's quite soul destroying when you're trying to manage disease on farm and just to wrap up I want to just just highlight um, the role of information this is an area we're really focusing on now three things that three things are starting to suggest that inflammation is key here firstly new bone is almost always the result of an inflammatory process when we see new bone it's almost almost always inflammatory secondly it would explain why when these lesion cows have lesions and we measure the digital cushion the soul soft tissue thickness it's thicker because it's swollen when they have a lesion and thirdly it would explain a treatment um, randomized controlled clinical trial we conducted a few years ago again funded by HDB dairy we uh, conducted a high quality we, we did it by the book randomized controlled trial which are the, the the gold standard for testing different treatments I'm not going to go through the details but we enrolled cows with claw horn lesions we randomly allocated them to receive either a trim only a trim plus a block, a trim plus a three day course of non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, anti inflammatory, analgesic, they go by a range of names, or a trim plus a block plus non steroidal. And we looked at the proportion which were either sound or non lame five weeks later. And we see the best recovery in the group that get a block and an anti inflammatory as part of treatment again suggesting that inflammation might well be key and that's an area we're currently taking forward in the in the work that uh, HDB Dairy have funded with us over the next five years so in summary for me excess pressure is on the dermis is caused by a combination of environmental factors the suspensory apparatus and the carving effect and changes to the normal structure and function of the hoof as disease progresses and so really in conclusion I've got a, a number of take-home messages and they are firstly managing the environment to reduce forces on the germal epithelium in the dermis is clearly key that's what most of the lameness control programs aim to do but perhaps really importantly early and effective treatment of claw horn lesions appear to be vital in preventing recurrence because if we intervene when animals first have disease 
we can try and pull them back off that escalator. If we leave them to this point, which I, I, I've, got, I've, I've, I've talked this a number of parts around the world and people smile wryly. I know it's not representative of, of what everybody does, but we definitely are in a situation where this sort of thing is, is one of the accepted norms for what treating a lame cow looks like and, and what it is. And again, I'm going to highlight, for me, that's not a lame cow, that's a cull cow. If we focus our effort here, we ain't going to get anywhere with lameness control. The animals we need to be focusing on uh, are these cows the point at which they become the first time they become identifiably lame because if we can intervene at this point we can prevent them getting on that escalator of, of progressive downward spiral I particularly like this because this is also a first lactation cow because it suggests that what we really need to target is control around those first lifetime cases of disease so early and effective treatment Inflammation appears to be central to disease and therefore the likely role of anti-inflammatories, non-steroidals, analgesics, painkillers, whatever you would like to call them, is only likely to in increase in the future. I think there's a real role in lameness control for these, this group of drugs. Managing, managing body condition score loss to peak yield may well be important to, to some degree, but as it's a standard part of any management herd, herd management program, it, it, it probably makes sense. And, and finally, the carving effect may be more important than previously thought. Um, I'm now increasingly convinced we need to target all of our lameness management around the fresh carved cow, particularly the fresh carved heifer. We expose them to this really destructive biological process, and at the same time, we throw them into a herd of animals they don't know who are bigger, stronger, and more familiar with the environment than they are, and then expect them to spend hours and hours each day eating so that they can give the amount of milk we expect them to give uh, and learn how to lie down in what is very often a, a very new environment for them. Uh, and so I think there's some really important lessons that, that we can learn in that area. Uh, I'd like to highlight um, all of our funders, particularly highlighting in HDB Dairy. They've, they've underpinned um, a lot of the work that we've been doing in this area um, over the last five years. It will, by 2021, be a 10-year program of, of lameness research they've funded with us. Uh, I work with a great big raft of collaborators and postgrad students. We've had some fantastic postgrads over the last few years. And as always, all I'm doing is taking the glory for, for a huge amount of hard work and effort that they've been doing um, uh, within our group over the last few years. Um, thank you very much for your time. I have run over a little bit. I suspect that, that might be the case. Uh, sorry, Jenny. Um, I would welcome uh, thoughts, questions, um, and uh, opinions. Thank you very much.